Thank you, Fiona, for that introduction and, of course, to the Centre for Social Justice for arranging this event, and not just arranging this event, but, of course, drawing much-needed new attention uh, to this problem of modern slavery in our community. And thank you, of course, to Rusi again for making available this, this lovely room in central London. And to so many of you for turning up today, it's, it's a pleasure to see you all. So I'm here to talk about modern slavery and uh, human trafficking, as it's known variously in different parts of the uh, law enforcement community across Europe. An issue which, as you know, is very complex. It's as complex as it is harrowing. An issue which around the world is generating, we think, approximately $150 billion of profit every year, much of it for organized crime groups. Um, and much of it actually happening in, in Europe on the streets and communities in which we live. At the same time, of course, not just the financial cost, but uh, a trade that is robbing the lives of vulnerable men, women and children. Now, as you know, it won't be long until the Modern Slavery Bill in the UK Parliament becomes an act, and I think the UK can be justly proud uh, to be the first country in Europe to put such legislation on statute books. The reason I'm here today is to tell you, despite that, there is so much more that we can do, also here in the UK and certainly uh, across the European Union. So much more that we need to do that goes beyond domestic legislation, goes beyond areas of responsibility and indeed goes beyond national borders. And what's clear is that we're talking about an international crime and I know from my work at Europol uh, that an international crime can't be solved with just domestic legislation and national policing. We need an international multilateral approach, certainly with more judicial cooperation um, between countries. I think international law enforcement action is the key in the fight against this terrible trade. It is, in, within our, it is within our community of law and order that we can disrupt the gangs that are responsible for plying this trade and who are operating in something that they recognise to be a low risk for high profit environment. And of course at the heart of it we have damaged and traumatised victims and we need, therefore, to get better at partnership working, building relationships with the NGO sector, health workers, those in education, border officials, local authorities, financial authorities, the private sectors, um, and many others in the communities in which we operate. And we need to get better at working together, not just across Europe, but the rest of the world. So that's a very wide span of uh, sectors that need to come together uh, together to fight this problem. As Director of Europol, I see daily the successes that are achieved when we do that in the law enforcement do domain, when police services from one country in Europe work with a number of others. And I see about the benefits that are immediately realised from sharing intelligence, from acting in unison to um, disrupt the activities of these organised crime groups. We facilitate at Europol thousands of cross-border police investigations every year into organised crime and terrorism. Investigating modern slavery is similarly complex uh, and not yet operating at that level, that scale of uh, cooperation, but that's the challenge that now faces us. Across Europe, organised crime groups are using established and increasingly mature networks to facilitate the recruitment, transit and exploitation of a growing number <coughs> of men, women and children. Different forms of exploitation await vulnerable victims at the destination country, but all of it in the end amounts to what is modern slavery. Now that's a term that is used here in the UK. Um, across Europe, trafficking human beings, or THB, is a term more regularly known. But I think there is a growing consensus in the international policing community that actually we should call it for what it is, and that is indeed modern slavery. In doing so, I think, therefore, we better explain to the public and beyond what is actually happening to these victims. And we remind ourselves that we thought that we had outlawed slavery over 200 years ago, and here it is back again. This time round, it is illegal and as such often hidden, <coughs> but it is in our countries. It's on our streets, in our communities, on the internet, and indeed in our conscience 
as a crime that we can't ignore. Now, as for the scale of the problem, this is part of one of the challenges that, that we face. Very, very difficult to quantify accurately the number of victims. And indeed, uh, different organisations employ different methods in trying to do that. So we have the International Labour Organisation estimating around 20 million forced labourers worldwide, at least a million of which are in Europe. We have Free the Slaves, an NGO, estimating between 21 and 36 million people held in slavery globally, at least 140 of which are trafficked people in Europe. And from the Global, Global Slavery Index for 2014, 35.8 million people in modern slavery worldwide, with over half a million people uh, in 37 countries of Europe. But Eurostat reports only about 10,000 registered, identified and presumed victims per year based on reporting from EU member states. Indeed, a tiny fraction of, of the NGO estimates. <coughs> And finally, in its annual report on trafficking published only yesterday, the UNODC studiously avoids putting any number on the size of the problem, citing methodological, methodological difference, uh, difficulties. So whatever the actual scale of the problem, it seems clear to me, however, that what's happening on the ground and what is being formally reported is not the same. There is a clear gap between the two. We're clear, of course, that what goes unreported also therefore goes unchallenged and unsolved. For our part, Europol doesn't uh, directly attempt to capture statistical data. Our primary focus is on trying to maximise the impact that we have to support effective cross-border investigations into the organised crime groups that are responsible for this trade, using our unique intelligence capabilities across Europe and our ability to coordinate, as I said earlier, thousands of cross-border investigations each year. <coughs> but our figures from our caseload give you some sort of indication of the scale of the problem that we're seeing in regard to modern slavery. In 2013, the main types of trafficking investigated by us were <coughs> sexual exploitation in 89% of the cases that uh, we were involved in. It's important to note that the majority of cases here refer to EU nationals traffic within the EU, which represents a distinct change from the historical problem hitherto. <coughs> Typical profile of victims forced to practice prostitution in red light districts, in brothels, nightclubs and bars, private flats or on the street under the strict control of organised crime group handlers. 89% for sexual exploitation and only 7% for labour exploitation. And across the total figures, uh, in our casework, at least 3% of cases involving child trafficking and 1%, for example, on trafficking of human organs. A fifth type is emerging, meanwhile, in prominence, and that's the exploitation in sham marriages, which seems to be a particularly new technique. And the most active police forces in terms of our case would reflect the main source and destination countries, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania in the former, and in terms of the destination countries, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium and here in the United Kingdom. And groups are often trafficking victims of their own nationality, as you can imagine, frequently recruited in the same regions, communities or even families. And the top victim nationalities we have or we see in Europe are those from Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and from outside, from Nigeria. But we have to recognise, meanwhile, the limitations of the data that we see at Europol. Um, in order for us to become aware of it, the crime, of course, has to be reported in the first place to police. The local force has to report it to the national level, and therein lies already a considerable gap, and perhaps an even bigger gap between reporting it from the national level to the European level at Europol. So I think, therefore, what we're seeing, certainly in our figures, is, is a gross underestimation of the problem. And in terms of labour exploitation, especially, we see a low frequency of cases at Europol, which only 7%, as I say. Almost certainly, in, I think, because police are not used to dealing with these particular type of cases. Even where they do handle modern slavery cases, prostitution is the market that they are most familiar with. 
In the end, of course, these numbers can only tell us so much. Behind each case, of course, lies a human story each time, and in many cases, the story of a child. We know through our casework of children being sold for just a few thousand euros, destined to be forced into a lifetime of begging, theft, and other illegal activities by organized crime groups. You can imagine that children are the most easily manipulated in our society, of course, and in the absence of any reference, may not even understand that they are being exploited in the first place. For even the most hard-headed amongst us, therefore, it's clear that this phenomenon has all kinds of policy implications, way beyond criminal and investigation. We also think modern slavery is one of the most financially lucrative crimes committed by the organized crime groups that we investigate in Europe. Complex nature, of course, and this is also felt uh, amongst the law enforcement community, and it's the challenges that come with the complexity of trying to understand the financial benefits of this make it very tough for the police to investigate, and indeed for the groups themselves to exploit the weaknesses in our systems. <coughs> Human beings are effectively used as criminal commodities, they are sold and exploited more than once and are therefore a continuous source of income for their slave drivers. Organized crime groups have established what amounts to a very successful business model, very entrepreneurial in some cases. They have networks online and across land, sea and air, some of which have become so established and profitable that it will take an enduring strategic response to disrupt them. And to achieve this, the international police community will need to show the same level of creativity, creativity tenacity, uh, and entrepreneurial spirit as the organized crime groups themselves. I'm not sure that we were yet showing that level of performance in the police community. About 10 years ago, I led some work on behalf of the United Kingdom, I was employed then in the UK police community, to raise awareness um, across Europe on uh, the need to fight this trade better. And with a few honourable exceptions, such as our colleagues in Ireland and the Netherlands, it was a pretty poor response, maybe more reflecting the weakness of my <coughs> leadership attempts at that time. But nonetheless, I think also demonstrated at the time, and to a certain extent now, uh, a lack of understanding, a, a lack of appreciation of how important this particular crime phenomena is across Europe. Certainly today, European law enforcement and indeed ministers see better, I think, the significance of this crime and the damage that it inflicts on victims. Indeed, we have come some way, uh, at least to correcting some of the weaknesses in our system. Based on Europol's threat assessment, EU ministers have identified trafficking in human beings as a priority in the overall fight against organized crime. They did this in 2011 and repeated it in 2013. And since then, Britain's NCA in particular, supported by Europol, has, have been instrumental in leading and coordinating a more effective European law enforcement response. But as I said, we're still behind the mark that we should be at. In 2013, Europol facilitated over 1,000 cross-border human trafficking cases. In itself, a four-fold increase since I became director in 2009. Seems like a high figure, but it's just 6% meanwhile um, of our overall casework at Europol. To understand why we're behind, we need to understand some of the real and perceived challenges for police in investigating uh, these crimes. And of course, the challenges involved in prosecuting the offences as well. Police, I think, in the past have, see, have seen investigating it as too time consuming. The wide re reaching geographic dimension in particular, I think, uh, puts them off. It often goes unseen as a problem, making it difficult for police to identify and reach their victims. And even when they do, the relationship between the exploiter and the victim is very complicated. Many suffer effects similar to post-traumatic stress disorder or indeed the Stockholm Syndrome, and often have a deep mistrust of law enforcement. The involvement of a number of suspects, victims and countries takes particular expertise. Protection needs to be secured for the victims during investigations, and the need to obtain evidence from abroad can act very often as a major barrier uh, to successful prosecution. All of these challenges taken together can seem almost impossible to overcome, 
But there is a way through, I think, in particular, if we raise awareness, raise levels of expertise, and in particular give a focus to effective international policing work. To be clear, as things currently stand, organised crime groups, I think, are going about the business of modern slavery with near impunity and with little fear of being caught and pursued. So we urgently need, of course, to do much better at disrupting them and, and of course, making sure that we can put these people behind bars for a very long time. Of course, it's difficult and it will take time and we need to improve and adjust our response, but it's hard to see how we should collectively shirk our responsibility to do the right thing, to free these men, women and children who are being moved around the globe and into such a miserable life. Modern slavery shares many of the same characteristics as any other form of organised crime, actually. The groups involved, including those involved with human trafficking, are involved in more than one form of criminality. In some cases, the low risk value of modern slavery provides financial leverage to pursue other serious crimes. Traditional policing intelligence tools are often the key to inf information. Networks of informants, telephone intercept, anonymous tip-offs. These underpin, of course, the deployments for substantial law enforcement assets in the war on drugs, for example. And it's often said in relation to trafficking of human beings that the intelligence picture is complete. But those same tools are equally available for what should be now an urgent fight also against modern slavery. We've had some very good examples <coughs> of disrupting this and freeing victims of modern slavery. One of the most publicized cases, I'm sure you're all aware of it, of course, is Operation Golf from 2010, an excellent piece of police work between the Metropolitan Police in London and their Romanian counterparts, which led to 126 arrests, 28 child victims rescued, and a total of 168 trafficked children identified across Europe. A criminal network that spanned several countries involved hundreds of children that were enslaved uh, to carry out criminal work on the streets of London and other cities around Europe in a very much a modern day Oliver Twist story, uh, one that led back to the hierarchy and some criminal kingpins in Romania. Excellent police work in that case to disrupt that organisation. More recently, the Met, this time working with the Hungarian police, broke up a highly organised forced prostitution ring in London. Conviction only in July this year of five men who'd over, over trafficked over 120 women into the United Kingdom. And in both these cases I mentioned, Europol and other European cooperation me mechanisms were instrumental, including the now famous European arrest warrant, I should say. This year alone we've had similar successes, breaking up organised trafficking groups in Portugal, in Italy, in Austria, to just name three of, of, of the major cases. And in some of those, links identified by Europol between Romanian victims being forced to work in Italy, mobile phone records in London and arrests in Italy were instrumental in the operational success. It's true that in some countries, some or all of these tools are being used, but it's not standard practice yet across Europe. And if we all accept that modern slavery is enabled by organised crime, then we need to attack it as such. Frontline officers need to be trained to recognise the signs, and they also need to know what to do with the intelligence that they gather, of course, feeding it into the regional, national hubs, so that a more accurate picture can be developed of the organised crime groups involved. The same then, of course, applies to um, information flows from the national to European level. Meanwhile, there is one place that even the most sophisticated police tactics struggle to keep up with shifts in criminal activity, a place which is increasingly consuming the resources of Europol and many other law enforcement agencies. Some people call it the internet or the dark web. In the police world, we give it the nickname of the Wild West because it's a highly volatile, unregulated part of our daily lives that is being considerably exploited by criminal groups right now. And in this field, the internet is frequently used to recruit victims, facilitate their transfer, and offer them whomever, wherever, and for whatever form of modern slavery. The scale and reach that the internet offers to the organized crime groups is huge, as is the potential certainly for easy profit. Our recent reporting just this month reveals that the online exploitation of victims provides various revenue streams for organized crime groups. In addition to payments from clients, 
crime groups even charge their victims for advertisement costs. Victims who, who end up in some form of labor exploitation are recruited through online advertisements promising a job in agriculture, collecting and delivering charity bags, construction, cleaning, transportation sectors, and so on. Adverts aimed at recruiting victims for sexual exploitation tend to offer work in cleaning, childcare, and administration services. Traffickers are purchasing tickets online to move the victims from country to country using fraudulent credit cards in order to hide their identities. And in doing so, neither the tickets nor the victims can be identified or linked back to the facilitators. And a new organized crime group, Modus Operandi, is emerging which is deeply concerning. Groups are now maintaining close surveillance of their victims by imposing daily email exchanges or chat sessions to prove their presence. And they're also being monitored using live cameras, webcams, which are often justified as security measures for their safety. So the level of entrapment and control is increasing uh, directly as a, as a result and as a, an abuse of the internet. Organized criminal, criminals, therefore, through the internet, simply move from country to country, safe in the knowledge that they are avoiding law enforcement in doing so, picking up new technological tricks on the way. Looking to the future of policing, this form of crime on the internet, I think, therefore, strongly that we need modern technology also for combating modern slavery. And if organized criminals can exploit and maximize their potential through the internet, then, of course, law enforcement leaders and policymakers need to do the same. We need to find the smartest minds to develop new and innovative ways of attacking cyber-related crime, including modern slavery. And as the nature of crime becomes increasingly borderless and the advance of technology leaps ahead of us, we need to pull, a pull together much more than we have done in the past. Pool our knowledge, our information, and our intelligence. The international law enforcement community in particular learn, needs to learn to trust each other a bit more. There is no point on sitting on a vital piece of information in one country if it could break a syndicate spread across five, five or more others. So the culture of policing, I think, must change to one based more on openness to understand new threats, to pioneer new response measures, and to cooperate much more freely with international partners. Few would deny that global crime threats cannot be fought effectively on the basis of piecemeal attempts across one or two national borders alone. So the multilateral frameworks for police cooperation, which are maturing quickly, and they offer a platform for a different, more responsive form of international policing. The challenge on our community and our police leaders in particular is to see what the full benefits of those opportunities might bring to their investigations. So what does that mean as I close my speech. We need to focus on gathering intelligence, on disrupting the human activities, sorry, disrupting the activities of the main organized crime groups. Intelligence needs to be shared more systematically so that police and policy makers have a realistic picture of the problem. We need to target the legal business structures that help facilitate or disguise trafficking activities like hotels and bars dating agencies, high-risk sectors like construction and agriculture. We need to look more closely at illegal immigration by paying more attention to false documents that can lead to abuse of the benefit systems and ask ourselves, and indeed HMRC and others, if trafficking actually doesn't lie behind some of this problem. We certainly need better technology, better partnership working, including with the NGOs and the private sector, more multilateral international investigations, and a better understanding of the organized crime groups involved in the trade. We need to make sure that criminal assets which make their way back to source countries can be frozen and ultimately seized. And most of all, we need a better understanding of how victims are lured into this life of misery in the first place, and how the traffickers themselves end up in pursuing such an evil trade. As we all know, Prevention in the end is better than cure, so high-profile public awareness campaigns in particular and internal police awareness and training campaigns, I think, should be at the heart of our strategic response to modern slavery. Thank you very much.